You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 168 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today's episode, we are discussing marine crocs. Hey, a crocs episode. Yeah, been a little while. It sure has. It's croc month. It's croc month. So we are doing our first ever return yeah, it, it has to been actual crocs. 166 episodes since our last crocs episode. <laughs> <laughs> In this episode, we're talking about marine crocs. Various groups of crocs and croc cousin, crocodile cousins, crocodilomorphs that have gone to sea. Mm -hmm. And so, as we know today, crocs are semi-aquatic, you know, very adapted for the water, but most are associated with freshwater. Yeah, they're not ocean-going. But throughout history, there have been actually numerous groups that have gone to salt water. Coastal, all the way out to deep open ocean. So we will be discussing which groups this includes and what are some of the things we see them doing to survive in this particular habitat and the unusually complex mystery of their evolutionary history and relationships to one another. Yeah. Now we are discussing this topic because it's just so cool. It's cool. It's oh, Croc Month. I had so much fun putting these notes together. <laughs> but also it's requested, as all our episodes are. This topic was requested in various forms from Marine Crocs to just more Crocs <laughs> from Devo, Jonathan, Anna, Brachiosnorus, Matthew, and Joel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for this perfectly Croc Month uh, associated episode topic. Now, before we get into the topic, some quick announcements. First and foremost, we have a Patreon. And our Patreon and the support from our patrons funds the podcast top to bottom, and allows us to do all the cool stuff we do. And when you sign up for our Patreon, you can get all sorts of extra goodies, bonus audio, bonus content, bonus contact with us. But one of the things you can get at certain levels is a shout out. So here to shout out our newest patrons of, of this level, welcome to Patrick, Michelle, Tim, Jack, Alexander, and Emily. Welcome and thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for your support. Also on the note of Patreon, and on the fact that it is Croc Month, we have a special tier on Patreon that is only going to be open the rest of this month and next month, which is the Croc and Snake tier, soon to be the Snake and Croc tier. Mm -hmm. That is a special level tier. It gets you many of the same benefits along with some special Croc and Snake specific ones. And subscriptions made at this tier will contribute to donations that we will be making at the end of these months to croc and snake research conservation funds. So if you want to participate in supporting us, check out the Patreon. If you want to participate specifically in supporting croc and snake months in this financial way, check out that tier. We are also doing bonus audio. Uh, at this point, the croc bonus episode is already up, so An you can go check it out. with Will. With, with me. The croc enthusiast himself. If you are, if after this episode you are not done hearing me, with, done with hearing me talk about Crocs, you can go check that out. And if you've already listened to it, listen to it again. <laughs> and there will be also bonus audio next month, so there sure will. Stay tuned. Anything else I should mention about Crocs? And until the end of June, the Crocs channel is open on our Discord server, which again. Once July starts, all this stuff is going to shift over into snake form. <laughs> and then we will celebrate snake month as well. Thank you to everybody who has been participating and contributing so far. Yes, it's been delightful. Check the links in the episode description for all that stuff. Links to the Patreon, links to Discord, links to our social media, and so on. And then our final bit of announcements is that we got some Croc and Snake goodies because we have gotten some fun bits of mail recently. We have a mailing address in case people want to send us neat stuff. And people did. Find it in the episode <laughs> description. They sure did. We got a bag of gummies from Patrick that was a bag of 
crock gummies and a bag of snake gummies. Yeah. Those snake gummies were life-size snake Yeah, gummies. they were they long. They were so long. <laughs> Each they were like three feet long. Yeah, so they like I had like super. They may, maybe they weren't three feet long. They were super long snake gummies. <laughs> I had like a, a full you know nut n- nest uh, a- eggs clutch worth of baby crocodiles. Yep. And then you had a few. <laughs> Just a handful. They they were I think there were like six in there, and they were huge. But they were that it was they were it was all very yummy and tons of fun. So thank you, Patrick, for that. And Elizabeth sent us a croc and snake packet, and with a. a Marine Croc coloring page, which is very apt because this was very, before yeah, well, we announced uh, uh, all the specifics of this. <laughs> and two little stone figurines, a, a carved snake and a carved little uh, a chubby dino croc looking dude. Yeah, to give you a sense of what they look like, the first thought that I think we both had upon looking at them yep. is that they look like the little figures from Jumanji. Very similar. And so we've got our little Jumanji figurines now. Yeah, uh, so we can play a game. Yes. In the jungle, you must wait. <laughs> So thank you so much to both of you. Thanks. If you'd like to send us stuff, you can find that address in the description, along with all of our social media and email and the discord and so on and so forth. Indeed. Get in touch. Let us know your thoughts or give us cool stuff, whichever you send us presents. Yeah, we will. We will never say no to presents. (laughs) (laughs) And with that. We can wrap up our announcements, move on to our first official section, which is the news section. Every episode, we like to start off with some recent science news to keep us all up to date on what's going on in the worlds of paleontology, evolutionary biology, and earth history. David, what's the news for today? As usual, I've got two newses, and you'll be delighted to know that both of my newses are Archosaur-related newses. Neither one's about crocs, but they are about... The Crocs fellow archosaurs. This first one is a new dinosaur, specifically a new dinosaur in the ornithopod lineage. This is the group that uh, also includes things like hadrosaurs and your iguanodons, things like that. This is research published in the journal Plus One by Lindsay Zano et al. And in the blog post after this episode, we will be linking to an article about this news in Smithsonian Magazine written by Riley Black. The new dinosaur is named Yanni Smithi. I think that's how you'd pronounce it. Cool. It is an ornithopod, like I said. This is that they're they're the major group of herbivorous dinosaurs without the accoutrement of all the other or, or major groups of herbivorous dinosaurs. Yeah, the minimalist right. ones. No horns, no spikes, no armor, no dome heads, none of that. They are uh, often you'll hear hadrosaurs called the cows of the Cretaceous. That is, yeah. The yeah. ornithopods <laughs> is that sort of broader group. This one, Yanni is, like other ornithopods, beaked, plant-eating, and about 12 feet long total, which is not particularly large for one of these dinosaurs. This one comes from Utah, from the Cedar Mountain Formation, and in particular, a member of that geologic formation that is about 99 million years old, which is important because this is the middle of the Cretaceous, a time of transition that scientists are still working on understanding. At this time, there are global climate shifts. We see, particularly here in North America, a major turnover of what dinosaurs are particularly prominent in other places. Sometimes, as uh, in, in part, perhaps as a result of climate shifts. Also, there is a lot of migration into North America from other places, particularly from Asia. So there's this major shift, ecological shift in progress, as the early Cretaceous gives way to the late Cretaceous. And in the late Cretaceous, then you will start to see eventually hadrosaurs and horned dinosaurs and armored dinosaurs. This particular portion of the Cedar Mountain Formation, the Musantuchet member, is a great place to study for this particular time period. But most of the dinosaurs known from this place so far are bits and pieces. Lots of teeth, not a lot of good, complete specimens. There have been some recent studies that have been identifying other better known dinosaurs from this geologic formation, giving us a better sense of this ecosystem. I think Moros came from here, who's now famous, uh, or more so than it was even before. (laughs) This new dinosaur, Yanni, this ornithopod, is known from a single specimen with a well-preserved skull and parts of the backbone and limbs. Not bad. A good portion of skeleton. Comparing its physical features to other known dinosaurs and running a phylogenetic analysis, the researchers identified it as an early diverging lineage 
of ornithopods. So not one of the, you know, this isn't a hadrosaur, not the you know, duck bills as they are called. This is an early branch of the ornithopod group that are known as rhabdodontomorphs. Other members of this group have also been found in Europe and in Australia. This is the first one confirmed from North America. Okay. So not only is this a new place showing us that this group was present in more places, but tells us that this group survived into the early parts of the late Cretaceous. During this transition, this is one of the groups that made it, at least for a little while, into the late Cretaceous. Cool. This is interesting because this geologic region has also given evidence of members of other important groups of herbivorous dinosaurs that held over from the early Cretaceous into the early late Cretaceous. So it looks like this is this discovery is part of this picture that's coming together that this time period in this place has a diversity of early lineages of herbivorous dinosaurs. There's also horned dinosaurs and armored dinosaurs that were lingering on for a while, even while the later groups were starting to appear to become more common, to become more prominent, and eventually would go on to become the big deal members of their ecosystems. Yeah. So it's this time of transition, and this particular fossil deposit is helping to understand what was going on during that transition. Interesting. Makes you wonder if there was anything you know, about this area that gave them that opportunity to, to hang on longer. Right, or... was this a refugium? Yeah. Or is it just the only place that we've gotten to explore so Exactly, far? yeah. What, do, if we find similar sites elsewhere around the world, we find out, oh, actually, lots of similar lineages mm -hmm. also hung on in other parts. Right, it wasn't just Utah. Yeah, or did something about this area give them a, a you know, safe space to hang on a bit longer past where others did? Yeah. Very interesting. They also mention, uh, related to that point, that this group of dinosaurs, in particular these rhabdodontomorphs, we don't know how long they survived or how widespread they would have been in this area or when or why they went extinct because we're still working on relatively limited info on that. So that is one of the lingering questions here. All right, these dinosaurs were sticking around, but we still don't know how long they stuck around or why they were able to stick around. And then the fun final fact here is that the name of the dinosaur, Yanni, I-A-N-I, is named after Giannis, a Roman god that oversaw transitions. Oh, that's awesome. So they named it for this cool time period, that it, this mysterious period of time that it comes from. Cool. Yeah. It's fun when you get a glimpse into that more, like, minutia of dinosaur research where it's like this is a, a very specific group that i hadn't heard of before it, it sounds like they were only recognized like several years ago yeah. for the first time this this particular group of of ornithopod dinosaurs so it's it's fun when because like so often the news is focusing on the big famous names mm -hmm. it's fun when you get a bit of news on like the the more niche i guess is the word i'm looking for like Sure. Specific dinosaur research that's going on that's like, here's this specific group that's fairly recent and we are still learning about, and we're learning as to how much they did or didn't make it past this transition. It's like very specific stuff, but still very cool. Yeah. It's nice to get a, a glimpse into that nitty gritty stuff, which is fitting because there'll be some of that in this episode. All right. My first bit of news is about a new dolphin with oh. very weird teeth. You know, I was ready to poke fun at you for not picking an archosaur if you didn't. <laughs> but that's also very fitting yep. for this episode. Yeah, that's no, a secondarily aquatic vertebrate. Both of my news are, are, are uh, <laughs> very much themed to the episode. This is a dolphin that preser preserves some really unusual tusk-like teeth. Ooh. This research is by Amber Costa et al., and is in the journal Proceedings of the Royal Society of Bio Biological Sciences. The article we'll be linking to in the blog post is by Margaret Osborne in Smithsonian Magazine. This new dolphin, you know, this new species of dolphin uh, is a fossil species from the Oligocene, so about 25 million years ago, and was found in New Zealand. Cool. Now, the teeth are just notably unusual, which is very pertinent when we're talking about dolphins and toothed whales, which includes dolphins and orcas and the sperm whale, the odontocetes, because today all of them basically have 
homodont teeth. All the teeth look the same, and they're basically all simplified cones for grabbing fish. Yeah. Which is unusual for mammals. Yes. Mammals usually have more complex dentition. Very common for fish eaters, very weird for mammals. But in the fossil record, especially during the late Oligocene, we do see more odontocetes, more toothed whales with a variety of teeth. With different shaped teeth and different kinds of teeth than just the the cone pegs that we see in today's dolphins and orcas. This dolphin is another example of that, but just a very, very unusual one. This new species has been named Nihohe Matakoi, and the specimen consists of a nearly complete skull, ear bones, which is always a neat thing to find, uh, the dentition, which we will be talking about, and a bit of the postcranial, so the body behind the head. Probably, in total length, it was about a six-foot-long dolphin, so... Eh, pretty, um, pretty small for a dolphin. Pretty small for today, <laughs> you know, when you think of balanose dolphins, so it'd be a smaller species. It did have a longer neck than today's average dolphins, and paddle-like front fins. Mm. So, I, immediately I started picturing river dolphins, yeah, which same. have those two things. Longer necks, paddle-shaped, you know, rounded fins. The teeth that are preserved, though... Uh, which includes all the incisors and the canines, are long, extend out of the mouth, horizontally oh. from the the opening and closing of the jaw. So they stick straight out from the skull. That's the wrong direction. Yep. So they have these splayed, very long, thin teeth. So immediately the question was, what are they using these things for? Their orientation does not allow them to be used for grabbing because they would be flat against the prey. Mm -hmm. Like the teeth would just be laying on the fish and they wouldn't be useful for trapping, which is, you know, we've seen teeth that come out of the mouth that kind of make a cage, but these are just flat. So they wouldn't form any sort of trapping structure. They don't show any wear patterns. So scratches or signs of teeth rubbing against teeth or other stuff, which suggests that... They weren't being used to, like, sieve, mm. you know, to sort like, through, like sand. through the sand yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and anything, because they would have been rubbing against rocks and sand that would have beat up the teeth. The teeth also have very thin enamel, so they're very delicate for stuff like that. Which, that, along with just the fact that they are fairly thin, not very robust, says that they probably weren't used for combat, either with other dolphins or against predators. Mm-hmm. So, a, a lot of the things that you would typically initially suspect get kind of knocked off. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that you expect teeth to be used for. Yes. What they think they might have been used for was prompted by other features of the skull and skeleton. The skull and the snout is flattened. Mm. So very low top to bottom and wider than your average dolphin uh, uh, head and snout. The snout is very long, the rostrum as you'll see it called, and the neck is longer with unfused neck vertebrae, so more flexibility Mm. than your average dolphin neck, they think that these teeth were used in a side-to-side slashing motion like a sawfish. Yeah. With a flexible neck to extend the range of that slash, a flattened skull and snout to be hydrodynamically efficient through the water, and that they would slash at prey before gulping them up. Interesting. Which sounds super weird, but like you just pointed out, we have... Fish that do that. Yes. The sawfish, that's exactly how they hunt, is they swing that big saw snout, that rostrum, through seagrass, slice up a bunch of fish, and then just go pick up the pieces of their injured prey. Now, based off of the features of these teeth, this would likely be used against soft-bodied prey. Mm -hmm. So they cited, like, squid. That's what they are proposing as the behavioral answer for this weird skull, which is... As you mentioned, not something we see. You know, there's no feeding like this observed really in uh, uh, tooth whales a day. The closest I could think of is that I know narwhals have been seen hitting fish with their uh, their yeah, long yeah, tusk. Yeah. And they'll stun them. Mm-hmm. But it's a kind of similar. <laughs> right. But, but definitely not the same thing at all. <laughs> when they looked at their relationships to other dolphins phylogenetically, uh, they found that they are basal in the Wipatiid group, which is a ancient group of toothed whales that many also had weird protruding teeth. God, so, so this is a feature of that group, the, that, the, the weird tooth toothed whales. This species seems to have just taken to a unique extreme mm-hmm. and used these extending, per, percumbent is the term for coming out of the mouth, percumbent teeth in a 
unusual or unique way for whales. That's really cool. It's always, it's always fun to see more diversity of certain groups of animals in the fossil record. And it strikes me to see it in toothed whales because, and I, I have a not completely fair image in my head of toothed whales, dolphins, porpoises being a very sort of standard set of species. And that's not fair. There, there, there's variation yes. there. But weird dolphins is not a thing that you get to experience very often. A dolphin that has just gone and done a weird thing compared to other dolphins. Yeah, they're a very successful group, but they it is very easy to kind of see them as all very similar. Right. Whereas they are very much like sharks mm-hmm. in the sense that most of you are doing very much the same thing because it's the best version of doing that thing. And then some of you have weird teeth and weird shaped faces. Absolutely. Uh, one note they did make, which I thought was fun, since we've done an episode on tusks, is they did make a point in the article to specify these are not actually true tusks. Right. Yep. Um, I was thinking yep. that because we we <laughs> had that whole discussion, mm-hmm. episode one hundred and seven. Yep. Yep. The tusks to be a true tusk, the tooth must be open rooted and ever growing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we do have whales with true tusks. Narwhal tusks are tusks. Yep. That is the canine of the narwhal. These are rooted, they aren't ever growing, they just seem to be normal teeth, but they are sticking out in a very tusk-esque way. Yeah, very interesting. Well, like I mentioned, my two newses today are both archosaurs, and I I meant that they're not crocodiles, (laughs) which means that they're both about dinosaurs. This next (laughs) one's about birds, but it's not actually about birds, it's about people. Okay. And, and what they did with birds. Uh, fried them. Uh, well, not in this case, <laughs> but they're delicious. This is research by Laurent Davin et al. in Scientific Reports, and we will link to a press release in phys.org from Virginia Commonwealth University. This research describes instruments made by ancient people out of bird bones. Oh, yeah. This is pretty cool. So the instruments, they're described as flute-like but the paper, the sort of official terminology they use is aerophones. Cool. Uh, I like and I, that. I assume if we talked to a musician, they would describe why these are technically not flutes. Well, yeah, yeah. Because like, like, a flute is a, specifically a thing. Yes, yeah, like like each instrument is <laughs> what it is specifically because like how you blow air into it and how right. like that's very particular. These are also potentially used in a different way. Oh. These come from a site in Israel called Anon Malaha, which is about 12,000 years old. The site is associated with a group of people called Natufians, which was a hunter-gatherer culture from this region. This is in the Near East at that time. The team analyzed 1,112 bird bones from the site, identified them as belonging to about 60 different species, and found that seven of the bird bones had been carved into instruments. One of these instruments is fully intact, as they described it. It has finger holes. It has a mouthpiece. They could tell by the manufacturer of it that it had been made this way by grooving and scraping with small blades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So people actually went to work on this. Will is smirking because he's anticipating a thing. And I can tell you right now, yes. The answer is yes to the question you're wondering. (laughs) They identified that these were uh, these instruments were made from the bones of two different bird species, uh, the Eurasian teal and the Eurasian coot, hmm. which presumably they did not call them that 12,000 years ago, but that's what we know them as now. Well, that's one of the thoughts I was having when you were, you were saying it's not <laughs> technically flutes, so they call them aerophones. And I was like, man, I wonder what their name actually was. Yeah, what did they call yeah, them? Yeah, you know they had a name for it. They also identified that these instruments showed microscopic patterns of wear that indicate that they were used, that they were used or played. And then the authors describe when played, (laughs) because it's intact. Because of course. (laughs) So you blow right into it. When played, these instruments make a screeching sound, a high-pitched screeching sound, which they've interpreted as likely a bird call. That makes sense. It is meant to imitate a bird call. The researchers say that To them, it sounds specifically similar to kestrels and sparrowhawks, whom they mention because those are two species of birds that are known from other evidence to have been hunted by the people at this site. Okay. So those were already birds that 
it seems were important in that culture, either for food or whatever other purposes. So the fact that they make noises that sound kind of like birds suggests it could have been that these were used to lure birds. Yeah. Uh, Same way we use like a duck call today, except that you're luring in birds of prey. It's also possible they were being used for just communication, Mm -hmm. for whistling at each other. It's very possible they were used for music. It's also the the researchers note uh, that there could have been some more ritual use or Mm -hmm. perhaps even a spiritual use. Because, as I mentioned, those birds are known to have been important in Near East cultures uh, during this time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's potentially a bunch of different uses that these flutes could have been used for. That's so cool. I, it's, I always am fascinated by the, the diversity of instruments found throughout human culture because, you know, it's it's so common that you'll come across, you know, here is this instrument that is unique to this part of the world or this group of people at this time and you know you'll hear it and i i know i've had the moment of like really that's that that that's the noise you wanted to make interesting because that's not what i'm used to hearing Mm -hmm. but then you hear moments like this and it's like i wonder how often the materials available decided the kind of instruments that got made oh sure you know like if you're using bird bones, does that limit you to certain sounds or open up certain sounds that we wouldn't have? Right. Did you use the bones of specific species on purpose? Yes. Could it be that those, they had the, the right size mm-hmm. and shape bones? Could it be, if there is some sort of deeper connection here, are you using the bones of birds that are the prey of? Right. Those are, Do you already have sort of a, a connection between the birds you're using and the birds you're calling or imitating? There's probably all sorts of nuance that goes into it that we don't have insights into necessarily right now. Man, I really want someone who's like an expert in musical instrument history mm. to because I it's so cool how yeah. how tightly tied human culture and musical instruments are. The authors point out that this is in addition to all the things we're just saying. <laughs> other reasons this is a cool finding because our number one. Bone aerophones are not unknown in the archaeological record. This has been found elsewhere, but mostly in Europe. Okay. So this is a new play. These are the first from the Near East, the, the Levant region. They are also apparently the oldest bird call imitating instruments known from any culture. Ooh. These are our oldest bird calls. And, of course, sort of coming off of the conversation we were just having, looking at stuff like this can help us understand the history of not only potentially ancient cultures' relationship with the animals that they shared their ecosystem with, but also things like music or yes. spirituality or culture or whatever it was you were applying these instruments to. This, this I'm geeking out about this because I don't know why. It's, it's super cool. It's really, really It's a very cool finding. You saying it being potentially the earliest bird call, if that is indeed what they you know were trying to imitate, made me then think of the examples of bird calls you know, that we have today. And like a lot of people know the like kazoo looking duck call that mm-hmm. you blow, but another form of duck call that I only know because we had a, an antique one that I think used to be my grandfather's. That is basically a little box that has a lid nailed to it and a little s- swoop on one side of the box. So that there's a little gap between the lid and the box. Mm-hmm. And then you take a, another piece of, I think it was metal, like a little strip of metal. And if you, rub it against the edge mm. of the lid you stridulate stridulate just right it will make a really convincing duck call cool but it is really hard to do yeah i as a kid i got it to work like a couple times and i could just not you had to get the angle and pressure just mm. right i wonder how many things like that we find in the, the ar- archaeological record where even if we do find a instrument like this and we play it and we go oh that's the sound it makes if someone, if, if a like actual if one a of musician, the, no, no, give me yeah, that. Like, oh, oh, no, <laughs> you know, that's not what that's no, supposed to sound like. No, that's not how you hold your lips at <laughs> all while you do that. Why are you breathing that way? And I don't know if there were details mm-hmm. of like how they go about determining the variety of sounds it could be uh, making or what they specifically do to it. They may be a special technique yeah. that people are able to use. Well, it's like if I stumbled upon a French horn, I was like, well, let's find out what noise it makes. Yep. Yeah, that's not what it's going to be supposed to sound like. Whatever I do well, it's like, is going to be wrong. <laughs> you mentioned kazoos. It's like the first time you give somebody a kazoo yeah. and it just goes, 
And it's like, yeah, that's not that's not actually how you, you got to add some vibration yes. to it. <laughs> yeah. Like how many instruments have we found that that have that little caveat of like, well, you got like 30 yeah. percent of the sound it can make. But yeah. that can actually make the sound of 10 different birds. Exactly. Species. Yeah. If you someone who knows what they're doing has it. <laughs> So a pretty cool find. I thought that one was really interesting. Man, all right, let's get a let's get a, a, get a musical archaeologist, a musical anthropologist. Oh, yeah, that probably exists. If you are a musical anthropologist, uh, reach out to us. And Whether you else. study the archaeology of musical instruments or are an ar- anthropologist who plays music or sings, yes, you just while you dig, yeah, yeah, you're just whistling. Whichever combination, uh, we want to <laughs> we want to hang out with you. Submit your request now for uh, episode about instruments. <laughs> Very cool. My last news has uh, nothing to do with that, but everything to do with this episode. Oh? It is a crocodile news. Oh, haven't we talked enough about archosaurs already? Never. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit of news that's been going around a whole bunch yep. and is titled Virgin Birth in Crocodile. Right. Which sounds like a bear, like a big uh, uh, gotcha title right. that the but news articles are using. That's the phrase that headline writers use instead of the word parthenogenesis yes. that also is what the paper is titled because yep that's what that is. The, well because <laughs> the headline writers call it that because they saw it in the press release and the press release people wrote it that way because they saw it in the article and the people who wrote the article wanted it in the headlines yep <laughs> <laughs> this is the first evidence of parthenogenesis which is giving birth without sexual reproduction in in organisms that are supposed yes. to normally have to have sex in order to give birth. Yes. <laughs> Facultative parthenogenesis. This is the first case ever documented in a crocodile. Yeah, we've reported on this in in other episodes where we've talked about mm-hmm. there have been cases in fish and amphibians and other reptiles. There are snakes that do it. Yep. Never in crocs. Yes, yes, yes. This is research by Warren Booth et al. in Biology Letters, and the article we'll be linking to is by Sarah Kuta in Smithsonian Magazine. A lot of love for Smithsonian yeah. this episode. They, 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 Keep they, it up! They were doing a good job <laughs> while I was looking for links. So, parthenogenesis, as you mentioned, we've noted it in other vertebrates, birds, snakes, lizards, and certain fish. But it has been notably absent in other groups. You know, other reptiles, turtles and crocs had not been noted. Mammals haven't shown to do it. Mm. Stuff like that. So there seems to be a, a interesting breakup in which groups are showing it and aren't. Though that also is probably affected by the fact that we are only recently really becoming fully aware of this phenomena mm-hmm. as a thing that can happen unexpectedly. You know, that is not something that happens all the time with that group, but it can so it's potentially that our raised awareness of it is what is causing some of these new discoveries just to come to light right now we're on the lookout for exactly it. this is a situation like so many where unexpected eggs showed up and prompted the caretakers to look into it a female crocodile an american crocodile crocodilus acutus living in the park reptilandia which is a reptile park in southwest costa rica laid a clutch of about 14 eggs, which, you know, not typically a big deal, except this crocodile has been at that facility since it was two years old and has never shared their habitat with another crocodile. Ah. (laughs) For the last 16 years. So, unless there's some real (laughs) sneaky male croc that's snuck in there. (laughs) (laughs) And so... Laid a clutch, 14 eggs, seven of which appeared to be potentially fertilized. Okay. So they took the eggs out, uh, those seven, and incubated them. After three months, they hadn't hatched, so they decided to cut them open and see what was inside. And six contained unrecognizable contents, so nothing right. notable. Just gotcha. Egg goop, it sounded like. One held a fully formed, but evidently non-viable, crocodile fetus. Huh. So at least one had been self-fertilized and, by this female. almost mm-hmm. hatched a new baby crocodile. And so that sure does seem to suggest parthenogenesis. Yeah. To test this, and this is the way it's often tested, they do genome sequencing. They look at the genetics of this fetus and the genetics of the mother. And if they are effectively the same, mm-hmm. then that means only the female's genes went into this young. Because that's what parthenogenesis is. Normal sexual reproduction combines the genetic material of 
two parents. Mm -hmm. Parthenogenesis is you're just using what you have to work with and remixing it a little bit into a new organism. So it's going to be basically all the same. It's a clone, essentially. Yes, exactly. And sure enough, what they found was they were nearly genetically identical. Cool. So that supports that we have parthenogenesis in crocodiles, first time ever documented. Wow, and it almost worked, too. Yes. They did note some differences. Uh, The tips of the chromosomes in the fetus were a little bit different from the mother's, Mm. which suggests that the egg fused with a polar body, which is a small cellular sac that forms at the same time as the egg and will contain chromosomes similar to the mother's. And so it seems like those fused to form this fertilized embryo. Usually polar bodies just die off in, you know, non-parthenogenic situations, but they have noticed that it will fuse in the other uh, animals that parthenogenesis has been noted in. Quite frequently. So this seems to be a regular phenomena among parthenogenic groups. They were also able to determine that the mechanism of reproduction, and I wasn't sure if this is what's ref- is the term for that polar body. Uh, I couldn't find a clear definition, but that the method of parthenogenesis in this case was terminal fusion automixis, which is just the particular way that things were recombined mm-hmm. to cause this parthenogenesis. And is the same mechanism seen in other reptiles that are parthenogenic, which suggests potentially a common evolutionary origin for reptile parthenogenesis, including birds. Yeah, they're using a similar pathway Mm -hmm. to do this. So this may be a feature that evolved at the base of the reptile tree and then has been spread out across reptiles and is showing up in some groups but maybe not others, but could be more widespread than we realize Mm -hmm. if it is something that is ancestral. Which, of course, brings up the question of if we're seeing it in birds and we're seeing it in crocs, and that's the two modern archosaurs, and as you've given great examples, archosaurs includes dinosaurs. Yep. Could we have seen it in dinosaurs? Which the answer is, I mean, of course, we'll never be able to know (laughs) until we somehow can magically genome test dinosaurs. But this actually makes it kind of likely that it could be a thing showing up. Sure. And dinosaurs were so diverse and and lived all over the place in all sorts of different lifestyles. And so many animals have exhibited parthenogenesis. It would be not at all surprising to learn that, like, yeah, every now and then a velociraptor could just produce its own young without sexual reproduction. Exactly. Or maybe we even had whole populations like those lizards. Yes, it was like an entire population of female velociraptors. Yeah, that just... Just uh, like in that movie. Yeah, and everything went fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is the actual thing that happened in Jurassic Park. Yes. Like, I I, I love the notion, my little a little headcanon suggestion, that Grant's like, oh, West African frogs can change their... No, it was just parthenogenesis. Yep, yep. That was, that's, that's all it is. Nope. This is way more mundane than what you're <laughs> suggesting. <laughs> it's just something that they could They were able to do this before you'd mess with their DNA. Yeah, they already had this. Yeah. They had nothing to do with frogs. You just, you just didn't know that because we only had fossils. <laughs> there are still some big questions when it comes to parthenogenesis. We're still trying to understand this phenomena. We don't have an answer as to why it seems to randomly happen in these groups. You know, mm-hmm. why it seems to be a option that is there. People have suggested that it could be that it gives chances for reproduction when a mate is not available. Sure. You know, that in those uh, dire survival situations, it could be a situation when populations are getting particularly low that this has been an evolutionary benefit if some of you can just spontaneously reproduce. But it also could just be a random thing that happens and doesn't actually have a benefit because even though you do get to reproduce, you also lose all the genetic variation that you would have gotten had you sexually reproduced. Right. So it's a trade-off. They did note that this situation is doubly unique. It's not just the first time noted in crocodilians, but crocodilians lack sex chromosomes. So they do not have Mm -hmm. genetics that determine whether the young will be male or female. It is determined through temperature of the incubating eggs. Right. Which is unlike all the currently identified parthenogenetic vertebrates. Gotcha. All the other groups do have some form of sex chromosome. This is the first time we've seen it in a group without that. And so that is a unique example of of self-reproduction just from that standpoint. Yeah. It's also interesting that these eggs did not 
did not appear to have been viable. Yes. Which makes me wonder, it, could it just that we happened to find one that didn't work? Mm-hmm. Because that happens with norm, all forms of reproduction, yeah, yeah. all your expected forms of reproduction. A typical clutch of eggs will have some that don't make it. Right. Or is it that this species is not very good at parthenogenesis? Was could this a be... really off, you know, random one-off event? Yeah. It's also so hard to know how common parthenogenesis is. Because, like you mentioned, we have only relatively recently become sort of on the lookout for it. But also, much of the time, we are only going to notice it if we genetically test parents and offspring. Mm -hmm. If we see a random crocodile or alligator out in the wild lay eggs, most of the time there's no reason for us to suspect something unusual may have happened. Yeah, basically. Should, oh, yeah, no, you probably, I, I assume you met a yeah. male at some point and you reproduced and you have eggs. So it may, it's very difficult. Almost all these cases, as far as I know, are from captivity when someone goes, that animal shouldn't have laid eggs. Yes, exactly. And we know because we've been monitoring them. Let's do some testing and identify what this is. Mm-hmm. And so without genetic testing, every offspring and adult you know, because I mean, could we also get ones where you have like a mix where you mated and half the clutch is from that mating, but the other you just made yourself? Yeah. That could that be happening? There's a lot we still have left to figure out with this this uh unique reproduction. And with that, we've had we've talked about Crocs as much as we needed to. That's never true. <laughs> But it is a perfect segue into our main topic because the American crocodile is a saltwater tolerant crocodile, oh. but not a marine crocodile. So what does it mean to be a marine crocodile and what crocodiles have ventured into the ocean? We will discuss after the break. Let us start by breaking down some terminology. So marine crocs, marine is referring to saltwater habitats. Mm -hmm. That could be coastal, so right alongside the beach. That can sometimes also refer to estuaries where the rivers are mixing with the ocean. But typically you will most often see it referring to living off the coast or out in the open ocean. So out in saltwater habitats. As we mentioned most crocs today are either you know aquatic but typically we call them semi-aquatic because they can leave but many of them spend a huge portion or majority of their life in the water but typically we associate them with freshwater and there are ones that go out into salt water but basically always return to freshwater habitats so today's crocs that we have are basically all freshwater or saltwater tolerant, but not actually marine. Mm -hmm. They're not actually living in the ocean. When we say croc, though, I also wanted to define that because that can refer to different tiers of classification. Yes, and people have expressed confusion about this before. Absolutely. We use the word croc very loosely. Yes, (laughs) and it's just because there are a lot of levels. This is actually a very big group. So break it down, and we will reference back to this throughout the episode. Crocodilla morpha is the really big group that includes basically everything that's croc-like. Basically everything that's more croc-like than it's not. But a lot of these are not going to look like what you think of as crocs. They're going to kind of look like four-legged little dinosaurs a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So big diverse group, but crocodilla morphs is everything that you could look at and go, that's kind of crocky. Crocodilla forms is within crocodilla morpha. Crocodilla forms... A little bit more croc-like. This is where a lot of our groups we will be discussing today typically fall, but not always. Mesocrocodilia is one step closer to our main crocs. Metosuchia is another step. Neosuchia, then Eusuchia, then within that is Crocodilia, which is today's crocodilians, alligators, crocodiles, gharials, caimans. Eusuchia means true crocodiles. These are what we actually call crocodiles. Whilst everything above that is close to or just related to crocodiles. But we will often see, you will often see any member of any of these groups called crocs. Mm -hmm. These are all the groups. There are other groups. You have pseudosuchia and suchia 
kind of means crocodile. That is the kind of the Latinish crocodile term. And so there are other groups that we could expand out, but Crocodilomorpha has your contains all the crocs and very croc-like members. Crocodiliforms is where a lot of the members we'll be talking about are, but we are going to be jumping up and down that classification ladder. But for Crocodilia, today's modern crocs, there are no true marine members. But we do see saltwater behavior. There are plenty of examples of them going out into saltwater. And in fact, all crocodilians, except for alligators, have salt glands. They all, all crocodiles have salt glands on their tongue, which is a weird place to have salt glands when you compare it to other groups that have salt glands. They have lingual salt glands on a keratinized tongue. Their tongue is not flexible like ours. Their tongue is basically fused to the bottom of their mouth. And then they have sweat glands that sweat salt water. <laughs> yeah, a lot of animals that go in and out of salt water will have glands to dispose of that extra salt. Exactly. That's the problem with salt water. Mm -hmm. Is if you're not adapted for salt water and you spend too much time in it, you your body will become too salty. Yes, this is why drinking salt water can kill you, mm -hmm. even if you're dehydrating, you know, even if you're going to die from lack of water if you drink salt water it'll kill you faster because the salt is too much for your body to handle and that's the case with many animals especially ones who have gone back to the water so you have to get rid of that extra salt now we do see uh, that alligators and uh, caimans and gharials do have glands on their tongue but they don't produce hypersaline secretions so they can't get rid of salt but they may be the same glands, potentially, which could either suggest that these are the glands they evolved from or that they these groups lost the ability. And we'll discuss that a bit more later on. So today, all crocodiles, crocodilus, and their related genuses have salt glands, but not all of them spend a lot of time in salt water. So even with that group, even with the ability to handle salt water, we don't always immediately see them just living at the beach. Most of them still spend the majority or basically all of their lives in fresh water. They just can handle salt water, but they don't seem to prefer to ever. The two main ones that you'll see spending time out in the waves are the American crocodile and the saltwater crocodile, or estuarian crocodile. So mm -hmm. Crocodilus acutus and Crocodilus porosus. One is found here in the Americas. One is found in Oceania, Australia, the Philippines. And both are known to travel between islands. Find a, You'll find them on the beach quite regularly. They've been known to hang out around reefs. They've been documented out at sea. The saltwater crocodile, Porosus, is by far, though, the most well-known to frequent out into open waters. They've yep. been found miles from shore. And only three times have we tracked them out at sea. But when we did, they were able to move kilometers a day like up to 30 kilometers a day out in open ocean waters, mm -hmm. sustaining movement for many days in a row. And when similar monitoring was done on a croc moving long distance across a river, we found that they actually will utilize surface currents to make their movements more efficient. So they are very good at living out there, but we basically always see them return back to rivers at some point to get their fresh water back and rehydrate. So today we don't have any marine crocs we have crocs that are really good at it but none of them that are dedicated to it but we did used to have marine crocs in crocodilia and not in the groups you'd suspect gharials and false gharials mm -hmm. had marine members which is super weird considering that today those members are almost strictly freshwater yep <laughs> that the indian gharial and the false gharial tomistema are freshwater crocs they basically never venture out into salt water and are often restricted by it if they're on islands we don't see a lot of movement between populations from island to island because they don't want to go through the salt water but in the fossil record they did have coastal members ones that are preserved in coastal habitats uh these are actually fairly recent in the cenozoic their species richest was at its highest during the miocene and they seem to mostly have disappeared at least from ocean habitats, uh, by about the Pliocene syncing up with a lot of other extinctions of marine megafauna we see at that time. But this included some successful groups, like there were numerous members of these uh, uh, marine 
Gabby Alloids, which will uh, see the overall group of Garials and False Garials, which are currently grouped together, which we will talk about more later. <laughs> um, many of these looked like today's Garial with a long, slender snout. Many of them were a similar size. Sakakosuchus was about a 14-foot, you know, 4.3-meter long croc, so very just Gavial, but out in the um, at the beach. Some, though, got big. Sicko Gavialis was uh, the only size I could see described, but it was listed as a giant Gavialid, was probably twice the size of Sakakosuchus. Wow. So, like, almost maybe 30 foot long coastal garial type croc. Big, long, slender snout, just giant. So, this was a successful marine croc group that it was true crocs, you know, crocodilia. Yeah. What we think of as crocs today. Maybe that's why modern day gharial species don't go into salt water. <laughs> right? They know. They're like, no, no, like, I know who's in there. It's like, no, we promise they're gone. I'm not risking it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they have that deep memory. <laughs> I I will stay here and be adorable. That is not our realm. Yes. I know where I belong. <laughs> Listen, I like to stay in my lane. <laughs> there are other marine croc groups outside of Crocodilia. Most of these are found in the Mesozoic. So age of reptiles during the time of the dinosaurs was the time when we see the most abundance of crocs out in the ocean. Yeah, because once the Cenozoic came in, whales and pinnipeds started going in there and taking up all the good habitat space. Like there are Cenozoic marine crocs. And for a while, they were actually some of the biggest marine predators Mm. uh, on average. But this is definitely the heyday is the Jurassic into the Cretaceous. Some groups staying in the Mesozoic. Some actually did make it through the KPG. Oh, cool. Uh, One group that did that was the Tethysuchians, which is a group that we will be talking about quite a bit later on. This is aquatic croc group, so very croc-esque. These are Neosuchians, so just outside of being what we would call true crocodiles, but very croc. You know, long snout, low to ground body, short legs, long tail. They were aquatic as a group. They are known from the late Jurassic up into the early Eocene. So they make it through the KPG and continued to be uh, both aquatic and marine. So about 100 million years Mm -hmm. of time span all the way into the early age of mammals. Yeah, so they were a successful group. Once again, they are fairly, they look actually very Garial-esque. Not all of them. There was variety to the snout shape, but a very common snout you would see show up in this group was long, slender, what we call longerostrine, which just means long snout. Your lo- snout is long and thin, more like a broomstick than like a pizza slice. They also, though, had other features of the skull. They had a higher tooth count than average, which is something we see in gharials mm-hmm. compared to other crocs. We also, they had enlarged supratemporal temporal fenestra, which means just very big openings on the skulls that are characteristic of garials and similar skull shapes. Oh, interesting. We see that show up with them. So they have a very garial shaped skull, not just in that superficial, it happens mm-hmm. to also be long, a lot of similar adaptations. Yes, which suggests similar mechanics in musculature that likely they were probably snapping the same way today's slender snout crocs would. Mm-hmm. Something interesting here is they had two different marine groups that seemed to be separate. Huh. You know, the philidosaurs and the dryosaurs. Now, the philidosaurs were not all marine. A couple of members were. But the dryosauridae is a marine croc group within Tethysuchia. Philidosauridae, the philidosaurs were freshwater aquatic, it seemed, as a rule, with a couple of marine members. This group was successful from the late Cre- Jurassic to the late Cretaceous. So they made it up until the end of the Mesozoic, but they did not make it past the KPG. Yeah. If anyone is saying, why do I know that name? This is the group that has Sarcosuchus in it. Aha. So that's why Sarcosuchus is not a true crocodile, but it is close to being in the same. It's a Neosuchia, but it is a Philidosaur. It's one of the best known Philidosaurs. Sarcosuchus, of course, being famously one of the biggest crocs of all time. Yes. And not one of the biggest, like it has the bronze medal. It's tied for yeah, first. Exactly. <laughs> with it a couple of others. Trying to shoulder out Dinosuchus and Purosaurus for the 40 yes. foot croc size group. <laughs> yep. There are two members here that are marine. Terminonarius, which is a late Cretaceous croc found in North America and Europe, has elongated snout. 
thin teeth, very Gary Oldman once again, and was a decent size, you know, up to 19 feet, so six meters, and seemed to inhabit the western interior seaway during that time, based on where its fossils are found. So likely, likely a shore predator, you know, so still mm-hmm. living at the beach, not out in the open ocean, maybe, but in salt water. And then another member, another different philidosaur, Oceanosuchus, very aptly named, also late Cretaceous from France, also seems to have been living in salt, salty habitats, but has a very different body shape, a more, you know, what you would typically think of typical or, you know, average crocodile shaped, more, a bit more Nile than Gariel, mm. more heavily armored than Terminonarius, wider, more robust snout, what we would call mesorostrian, or, you know, just middle snout you know it's just your average pizza slice crocodile snout which could mean that it was a little less marine adapted you know a bit more just typical semi-aquatic body shape but living in salty habitats potentially taking on heavier prey since it had a more robust snout than its cousin and then cousins to the philidosaurs the dryosauridae is a marine group totally These survived from the Cretaceous into the Eocene, so this is a marine group that survived across that extinction. They were found around the world, basically on every continent, and were known both in freshwater and saltwater habitats, but are a mainly marine group. They also showed a much wider range of snout shapes than we've talked about so far. Typically, a lot of marine crocs have that long, thin snout. These had, on average, more short wider snouts with more blunt robust teeth later members started to have more of those long thin snouts but overall the group shit goes from a mid-length and wider snout to a long wide snout to long and thin so they have a range of snout sizes and range of sizes in general some of these also got up to be 30 feet long or so wow uh and some of those were the ones with more blunt toothed wide snouts so these would have been chomping on big heavy prey yeah these could have definitely been taking down large animals at the shore if they wanted to yeah it's been thought that since a lot of these shared were uh around at the same time that this range of snouts could have helped them avoid competition Mm -hmm. and specialize into different roles niche partitioning is what you'll hear that called and many of these members were some of the largest predators that were in the oceans directly after the in Cretaceous. That since they survived into the Eocene, they actually were some of the remaining large oceanic predators. Cool. But all those groups get overshadowed by the marine croc group, which when you look up marine crocs, it will take you a little while to find any of those others even mentioned because the Latosuchians dominate this category. Thalatosuke, their name literally means marine crocodiles. Yes. This is a group of crocodilomorphs from the early Jurassic that lived from the early Jurassic to more recently, it seems, from uh, recent discoveries, early Cretaceous. Okay. Often it was thought that they were a Jurassic group, but... but some of them made it into the it Cretaceous It seems period. like we've been finding some early Cretaceous members, so the in-Jurassic extinction for this group has getting, been getting overturned, it seems, more frequently. The reason for my unsureness in saying that they are crocodilomorphs is that their positioning is very questioned as to who they're most closely related to. They are crocodilomorphs, so that, that is not actually in question, but... They've been grouped out as sister group to crocodiliforms. So a crocodilomorph, but not a crocodiliform. Or as a early member of crocodiliforms related to mesocrocodilians. Or within neosuchia, sister group to tethosuchians. Right. So literally almost from the bottom (laughs) of the tree I started out defining to almost the end. That they belong somewhere. They are somewhere within Crocodilomorpha, but depending on which bit you look at and how you compare them to other groups, they seem to be able to group almost all the way up and down the tree. So they are very, very unclear as to who they are most closely related to. Part of this because they are extremely specialized. They look very, very different from other groups because they are so specialized for living out in salt water which suggests that they are on a very long branch of the phylogenetic tree that, you know, they've been distantly related from other people to, from other crocs to be that different. But where they branched off is hard to say. 
And the earliest fossils we have of this group already look like Thalatosuchians. They've already got a lot of the marine features. They've already got a lot of the highly aquatic features. Not as highly aquatic as they will get, but they are already Thalatosuchians. Earliest of these show up in early Jurassic, so 180, 170 million years ago. We already see them with long, thin snouts and other adaptations that seem to suggest saltwater tolerance, and they seem to be living in saltwater habitats. They also appear to be quite diverse and widespread at that time already, so they have been doing well by the time we find their fossils. Currently, the earliest, the oldest member is Turnersuchus, which we mentioned in the news not too long ago because this is a very recent discovery. This is from the early Jurassic about 190 to 180 million years ago. So it pushed the time back just a bit. Currently, it is the earliest known member and is considered to be a sister group to the two main groups of Thylatosuchians. So typically when you hear about Thylatosuchia, you will hear about the Teleosaurids and the Metriorhynchids. Those are your two main morphotypes of Thylatosuchian. The Teleosauroidae is your more gharial shaped. They have legs and arms and a long thin snout and body armor, and they're great in the water, but not super ocean going, but still saltwater. The Metriorhynchoidae are your, many of these still look like aerials, but this is the group that becomes fully, fully, fully marine dedicated crocs with paddled limbs and seemingly no longer returning to the land. Yeah, joining the ranks of ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and mosasaurs in the reptiles that have moved out for a life at sea. Absolutely. But both of these groups were very successful and overlapped. The teleosaurs were around the same time as their you know, dolphin croc cousins. Both break up into different morphotypes as well. In the teleosauroidae, you have teleosaurids and machimosaurids. Both are going to look pretty much like crocodiles, just a little bit different here and there. They have those long snouts a lot of the time. They are saltwater tolerant, but still armored bodies, legs that could have brought them out of the water. They also had other similarities with the Gary with like the openings uh, on their skull for the eyes. Basically, it looks like the eyes are pointed up mm -hmm. when you look at the skull. So it seems like they likely were living like aerials just out in the ocean, uh, which is ironic since we didn't eventually get true <laughs> marine gharials. Yep. Now, while most of them tended to have those long, thin snouts. There was still a bit of variety. There were a few that had wider, more robust snouts. Most of those are found in the Machimosaurids. The Teleosaurids typically had the more thin snouts. They were also more often found in northern landmasses, Laurasian landmasses, while Machimosaurids tended to ha be a bit more robust and larger and lived more in southern landmasses in Gond mm. Gondwana. Once again, it's been suggested that this diversity might have allowed them to not compete when they did overlap. Uh, but whenever they did overlap, Mechimosaurids were always larger than the Teleosaurids and typically were more common in the fossil sites where they're found compared to Teleosaurids. So they were actually some of the most successful crocodilomorphs at that time and by far most common Teleosauroid groups. And once again, see them getting up to notable sizes. Teleosaurids, the largest ones we really have, are about 13 feet long. So these are typically smaller, more slightly built, more thinner snout, seem to be occupying, in my mind, I'm picturing freshwater crocodile from Australia, smaller, less robust, thinner snout. That seems to be what your average teleosaurids were typically doing. All right. Machimosaurus, Machimosaurus specifically, that genus, and Machimosaurus rex, the species is notably big. Uh, they were from the Lower Cretaceous, and size estimates have them going up to over 30 feet long, so almost 10 meters, and is actually the largest Thalodosuchian period. So this group included the biggest members of the marine crocs, and was the largest crocodilomorph at that time. It did not yet overlap with any of the truly massive ones that come a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. And almost as big as the record-holding biggest yeah. crocodilla forms. Yes, exactly. So this group got big, and Machimosaurus rex was 
very croc. It had a longer snout than you would think for like a saltwater crocodile. So not quite the specialized, I'm taking down big, heavy you know, land prey, which is what we see with saltwater crocodiles and Nile crocodiles, but more robust, more V-shaped, more pizza sliced than the long, thin snouts of your average teleosaurids. Right. I, I'm picturing the, the sort of the prototype for mosasaurs. Yeah, it's it's. It's it's longer than that. It's got kind of a sarcosuchus face where it's mm. it's a long snout, but beefy. And these would have looked very much like crocs. They would have had a you know their bodies are a, a bit different proportion wise, but all in all, just big crocodiles out in the ocean or out at sea at least. The metriorhynchoidae is where we start getting into mosasaur esque territory. Yeah. Now early members still just look like crocs. Uh, the earliest members, Pelagosaurus and Magyarosuchus, were very just croc-shaped. Still a little bit more marine, you know, still a little bit more specialized. Pelagosaurus is interpreted as being likely an aquatic pursuit predator, so like chasing fish, which is not actually what we typically see with most crocs today. Mm -hmm. That they are waiting and still ambushing even when they hunt fish. They will just wait for the fish to get too close. Uh, this one may have been swimming after its prey. It was also fairly small, like less than a meter or just about a meter in length. Oh, so adorable. Just around it's three feet. Super tiny for a croc. Yep. These were early Jurassic. And at this point, we're still looking very gharial-like, very long, thin snout. Magyarosuchus, which is a sister taxon to Pelagosaurus, is the largest known metarynchoid before we get into the metarynchids, which is where things get real crazy. This one was a little bit less than five meters. So once again, we're hovering up there around 15-ish feet. It still is has many of the semi-aquatic features of leg, arms and legs and being able to walk around. But one indication indicates that it might have been taking a step closer to aquatic uh, marine specialization. The tail bones, some of the vertebrae of the tail have elongated projections so elongated structures that seem similar to ones we see in other members of this group but also other marine reptiles that have a downturned tip of the tail which is an adaptation for a tail fin yep. a caudal fin to allow them to have basically a shark tail on the tip of their croc tail making them better swimmers in open water but it still had heavy armor on the body so this might have been basically a crocodile, but with the beginnings of a tail fin at the end, which suggests that the we saw a marine-like head form up before the rest of the body started becoming marine, mm -hmm. uh, giving us a clues as to what order of operations might have been for the evolution of this group. Then we get to the metriorhynchids, which are fully, fully marine crocs. Yeah. This is the group. The metriorhynchids are fully flippered, tail-finned crocs. They are 100% marine, the sea turtle of crocs. They have turned both back and front limbs into flippers. Their tail has a tail fin to it. They've lost their bony armor, so they no longer have osteoderms, that bumpy armor that crocs are so well known for, and have smooth, scaleless skin. Ooh. Uh, so they are... Fully hydrodynamic. Just a, just a shark croc. Mm-hmm. Uh, they even note that the specimens that preserve that skin, it is similar looking to the specimens of preserved skin from plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. Cool. That they are very, very comparable. Yeah, I'm picturing like dolphin skin. Yeah. Or something very similar. That it's just smooth hide instead of scaly and bumpy, and they've gotten rid of all that bony armor. They also have shorter necks, which gives them a more what we call fusiform body. Mm -hmm. Makes them more like a torpedo. Tor torpedo shape. Yep. Which is great for going through the water. And then we start seeing some interesting diversity. We have metriorhynchinae, which are long, thin-snouted metriorhynchids. Uh, they are similar to their teleosaurs, but now with flippers and tail fin. But still long, thin snout with sharp, tiny teeth. So flippered, gharial-esque very ichthyosaur, just without the dorsal fin. Mm. Then you have the group that's called the Geosaurinae, which has a couple of different members to it, but they have a wide variety of skull shapes. Some being thin snout still, 
but they also have short snouted members, which had flattened, curved, serrated teeth for taking down bigger prey and taking down chunk, you know, taking bites out of out of their prey, chunks when they take a bite. So members that seem to be hyper carnivorous. There are some members that were more general. Uh, Metriorhynchus was one of those members that had seemed to be generalized, kind of more alligator, just good at a lot of stuff. There are members that have crunching, crushing teeth for more durophagus. Sucotus is a genus that has non-curved, blunt, rounded teeth for crunching up probably hard-shelled or at least tough prey. Another member of that genus had the slicing teeth, and some of these were getting up to bigger sizes. Uh, Plesiosuchus was one member that could get up to over 20 feet or around 20 feet long, you know, so five to six meters, and had those slicing teeth in a shorter, more Mosasaur-esque skull. And then you had really divergent groups like Dacosaurus, which was discovered not too terribly long ago. That was within like uh, the last 10 years or so, which had a skull shape more similar to terrestrial predatory dinosaurs. Weird. To theropods, robust, short snout with sharp, uh, recurved teeth. Uh, they compared it in many ways to a leopard seal. Oh. This this powerful little carnivorous head. Uh, they were decent size. They were four to five meters, 13 to 16 feet. And so this one was likely specialized for taking down other marine reptiles, they suspect. Like, this is a skull made for taking down prey, getting up toward your body size. Yeah. And so we see this huge variety, and then most of them peter out at the end of the Jurassic, with a few members making it into the earliest Cretaceous. Uh, so like I said, that initially, classically, they were seen as a Jurassic group, but we've discovered at least, I came across at least two different members, and there may have been a third that I stumbled upon, that are dated to the very earliest Cretaceous. So potentially they made it across that barrier. It's not sure why they went extinct, but it is noted that their diversity seems to peak and reduce with sea levels. That as sea levels rise in Jurassic, we see it coincide with rising and peak uh, Thalatosuchian diversity. And then as they start to lower later in the C Jurassic and into the early Cretaceous, we see their diversity and range decrease as well. So it could just be as simple as ocean changes... Uh, uh, taking the wind out of their sails. It's fascinating to note how much diversity of fully marine, saltwater adapted crocs there have been in the past, because it's one of those things that we look at crocs today and we really don't see that. Yes. It is for all their success and for all their range around the world and for all their diversity of lifestyles and modern crocs, they really don't do ocean stuff. Mm -mm. And I know that for me, in the past, there was a time where I was of the knowledge, my, my interpretation of it, my understanding was that there was like one weird group of crocs that went out and became marine. Yes. But uh, this is a thing the croc lineage has done several times, yeah. which is really cool because they've done it more times than a lot of other lineages have done it. Yes. Like mammals have done it a bunch of times. Like lizards have only gone out into truly aquatic habitats so many times. This seems to be a thing that crocs are just particularly good at returning to the ocean. Absolutely. And that's exactly what we will start our next section talking about is what did the transition for crocs from land to sea look like and what patterns do we see? How did they do it? What are their adaptations? And why is it so hard to figure out who's related to? <laughs> <laughs> After the break. Now that we've taken a look at the diversity of marine crocs in the fossil record, one of the questions that has come up is how many of those groups are actually related to each other? Is there a single or just a couple instances of crocs going to the ocean and then diversifying into these many groups? Or are these many groups each individual examples of crocs going out to sea? There is... Quite a bit of uh, debate in some aspects of this, but we do find typically evidence for multiple incursions, uh, not just into the sea, but actually into water in general. 
Hmm. So today, crocodilians are semi-aquatic. They spend their time in the rivers and lakes, and that's how we know them. But ancestrally, crocodilomorphs were terrestrial. They lived on land. They had powerful uh, front and back legs for walking around. And over time, different groups became semi-aquatic. Hmm. So that is not actually a thing that just crocs did. Now, in the past, it was thought that crocodilomorphs had a single, you know, eventually just one group transitioned to being semi-aquatic and then diversified into the many croc-shaped groups that we think of today uh, and throughout history. This was typically thought to have happened in the early Jurassic. But nowadays, based on our better understanding of their fossil record, it is thought that they that shift happened multiple independent times in different groups of crocodilomorphs. So we've talked on the podcast a bunch of times about how the croc, the familiar crocodile body shape and lifestyle is something that has happened many times. That we've yes. seen that in amphibians. We've seen it like phytosaurs. We did a whole episode 142 last year's croc month. And that crocs as we know them are one of the examples. It seems that that crocodile lifestyle and body shape has also evolved multiple times in the croc lineage. Yes, exactly. But that is not the default for this group. It is just been something they have come upon multiple times. The current thinking is there are at least three instances that crocs moved into the water. Now, this is just becoming aquatic. So this can be freshwater. Mm -hmm. This can be rivers and lakes. This isn't just marine. Three instances. We see one likely at the origin of Neosuchia. So that includes all of our crocs today and their close cousins, like the Tethysuchia that we mentioned earlier. Things closest to true crocodiles, including true crocodiles themselves. That would have likely been in the mid to late Jurassic. We see another aquatic origin, likely at the beginning of Thaladasuchia. Okay. That they were their own incursion from land to water, separate from other groups. That would have also been in the Jurassic, though earlier, toward the beginning of the group itself. And then another transition... Among the Notosuchians, which is a Cretaceous group, we've mentioned them before. This had a lot of your terrestrial, you know, your interesting terrestrial gr- members like Simosuchus, the small herbivorous land-dwelling croc. Mm-hmm. There was a clade that does not have its own name, but it is a clade made up of the Solocrosuchids and the Mahajangasuchids. That group, that clade, seems to have made its own transition into aquatic lifestyles. Okay. So only the Neosuchian transition to aquatic life would be what our crocs are descended from. Right. All of our crocs are descended from semi-aquatic ancestors. Yes, indeed. But the transition from living on land to living in the water a lot of the time seems to have happened three separate times in very different groups of crocs. Yeah. And there is one other genus that is Calsoyasuchus, which might be a freshwater semi-aquatic early Jurassic croc which is specifically in a group called the Goniophilidids, that if it is aquatic, could potentially suggest a fourth Mm -hmm. separate transition. So crocs have gone to water multiple times. And a quick side fun fact, only twice have they ever been shown to go back to land, but it has happened. Right, right, right. Uh, Both within crown group crocodilia, so like the group that includes our modern crocs and their relatives going back to their common ancestor... Planocraniids and the famous Mekosukians uh, with Quincana are two groups that went from aquatic ancestors to being terrestrial predators. Yeah. But that's only ever happened twice. And then we've never seen any of those members go back to the water again. Mm -hmm. Among these now aquatic crocs, there seems to have been nine shifts between freshwater and marine, both going to marine at least five times. And going back from marine to freshwater potentially four times. So once they became aquatic, they were moving back and forth between fresh and salt water quite a bit. Which kind of makes sense if you think about modern day crocs. Yes. That most of them are capable of moving back and forth between freshwater and salt water. Exactly. So it makes sense that you'd see that extended out over evolutionary time of adapting more and more towards one or the other lifestyle. Yes. And so you see a ton of incursions into the sea. And it's interesting because it's different for each group. The Tethosuchians, the Dryosaurids, which were your more diverse snout-shaped group of Tethosuchia, seems to be their own origin into marine life. 
while in Philidosaurs, Oceanosuchus and Terminoneris seem to be each their own individual. Hmm. Each genus did it on its own separately within Philidosaurs, while the rest of Philidosaurs did not do it. It's thought that within Crocodilia, there were likely two independent transitions, one with gavialoids and one with tomistamines. So one with true gharials and one with false gharials, their ancestors, you know, their cousins. And this is mostly indicated by the fact that their distribution would have required many marine migrations to get them to where they are. But then the fact that today's gharial and tomistama are both freshwater suggests that those are both independent reversals back to freshwater, Mm -hmm. losing the marine attributes. While Thalatosuchia seems to be its own origin to marine life and suggests that it potentially skipped the freshwater phase. Oh, interesting. That it went straight from living on land to living at sea. Which sounds weird because in comparison to all those other crocs, but that appears to have been what probably happened with many other mm-hmm. secondarily aquatic organisms. Yeah. Like, that's probably what happened with, like, mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs and whales and things like that. Yeah, as far as aquatic tetrapods go that live out in the ocean, that's pretty, that's pretty standard. Yeah, but, but for crocs... Every other group seems to have gone from terrestrial to freshwater semi-aquatic ambush predators to marine predators. Mm-hmm. This group potentially skipped that. This is partially indicated by the only two Thalatosuchians found in freshwater habitats. Only two groups. These two are Papasuchus and one group that have, doesn't have a name yet, but was found at a site called Funoi, so it's known as the Funoi clade that likely are related to each other, sister groups to each other. So it's thought that their common ancestor transitioned back from marine to freshwater. These are both Jurassic groups. Papasuchus is from China. The Funoi clade is from Thailand. And the fact that these are fully nested within Thalatosuchia, so they are within the group, not an off-branch, suggests that they returned to freshwater. And since the earliest Thalatosuchians already show very heavily marine traits, it seems very likely that they just went directly to the ocean, Mm -hmm. which has them standing out from all other marine crocs and may mean that they took a different transitional and evolutionary route to get there and could be why we see only them become as marine specialized. The most marine adapted archosaurs that we've ever seen. Yeah, I, I was thinking, having the same thought because we see these other groups like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs become super specialized and super successful in the ocean. And this is the group of crocs that did it. Is there something about going straight from land to salt water that allows you to do that? Yeah. Uh, is it that once you ha- are adapted to freshwater habitats, being able to go back and forth is extremely beneficial yes. in the long term? So that if you have a lineage of those, if they get too marine specialized, they lose that really beneficial ability to go in and out of freshwater habitats that this group, maybe they never had to worry about. And they just, nope, full steam ahead. No looking back. We're going all the way out into the ocean. Exactly. And so, yeah, it's there are a lot of things about the way Thalatosuchian seems to have made their transition that is very unique to them and very particular to the way they seem to have done it. One trend that they did note, though, when it comes to marine crocs is it seems to sync up with sea surface temperature, that the groups we see going back and going into marine habitat seem to be absent from the higher latitudes, so closer to the poles on the planet. And those areas were occupied by ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, which could be that most research shows those groups were likely somewhat warm blooded, you know, more warm bodied, Mm -hmm. while these crocs very likely like crocs today, were more dependent on the temperature of their environment. And so the sea surface temperature might have been a big player into when it was higher and areas it was higher, allowing these transitions to happen. Makes sense. Which leads us into the discussion of how did these crocs do that? How did they get into the ocean? And we do see some consistent and reoccurring adaptations to life at sea, to life in a marine habitat. The most obvious, which you've already mentioned a bit, is salt glands. Yep. Salt glands, you need a way to handle all that salt. That's the first big change from freshwater to saltwater. That's why we named them that, is 
that one is salty and the other isn't, and that salt will kill you if you don't have some osmo regulation, a way to regulate your salinity and the water you're intaking. Evolving salt glands is something that tons of groups have done. Mm-hmm. You know, this has happened multiple times across many groups that have decided to go back to the ocean from land. Yeah, we see it in lizards, we see it in birds, and so on. It is very common. We already mentioned that crocodiles today all have salt glands in their tongue. And even the non-saltwater groups like algaroids and gabialoids still have glands, but don't seem to be active anymore or may not have ever had the ability. Which leads us to the two scenarios that either ancestral crocodilians had salt glands and it was lost in the alligator and caiman and gharial groups, or that it was something that came about after true crocodiles split from those groups. Most of the evidence I've seen seems to lean toward that it was lost in our non-saltwater groups because they still have glands similar but their glands could also just be the ancestral form. Mm. So it's it's unclear. This is also hard to track because that is a fully soft tissue feature. Right, that's not in the bones. We don't have a way to track which fossil crocodiles or alligators would have had salt glands. Our main way of tracking that behavior is what type of environments they're found in, which has come up with things like Dinosuchus, I know, which is a cousin of crocodile of alligators, has been found in salty habitats, you know, coastal habitats. And there is some fossil evidence from the fact that close cousins of crocodilia seem to have smaller geographic ranges, suggesting they weren't making ocean voyages to spread themselves out, which we also see in alligators and caimans and their cousins, that they don't tend to be as widespread as many crocodile species are because they are restricted by long ocean voyages which could suggest that the alligator state is actually ancestral, Mm -hmm. that they have not been a saltwater tolerant group for most of their history, but crocodiles evolved that at some point after splitting from alligator cousins, which would suggest, if that's the case, that it evolved at least twice, once for crocodiles and once for gharials and their cousins, since they did have marine cousins, even though they've now come back. Right. So they would be an example of losing it. The alligators would be ancestral and the crocodiles would have the evolved trait of saltwater tolerance. So it's it can get really messy trying to interpret it, especially when we don't have a bony feature to look at. We have a similar issue with the dryosaurids and the phyllidosaurs in that there's no physical evidence of salt glands. Most likely there was a separate evolution since we seem to have three different marine groups that all went there by themselves it doesn't seem likely but the ancestors could have had salt tolerance and just hung out in freshwater like most of today's crocs do Mm -hmm. so it can be very difficult to track yeah they also could have had salt glands in different places yes exactly like these ancient marine crocs may have had them like on the nose like uh, birds and uh, marine iguanas do or perhaps in a hole in front of the eye like the latisukians did Ah. They do have a different position for their salt glands unique to them that is in a spot in front of the orbits, the opening for the eye, that's shown in the bone. So Interesting. And that is kind of similar to what birds yes, have. Yes, it is. A lot, of, a lot of birds with salt glands, it's right at the base of the beak. Mm-hmm. So with them, we actually can track mm. their salt gland evolution and across the group because it is a feature in the bone. It would have had soft tissue that is not preserved, but the soft tissue was nestled in a bony feature. There's a little cavity. Exactly. This was first noted because a couple of metriorhynchids had three-dimensional preservation of the inside of the skull, endocasts, that showed the soft body of the the structure of the gland. And then we were able to note that that actually syncs up with these bony features on all these other groups. And through analyzing that feature have found that every thylatosuchian analyzed shows some amount of this feature. Smaller in the teleosaurids, so not quite as pronounced in the less open ocean group, and more pronounced in the metriorhynchoids, which have uh, uh, what they have often called hypertrophied, which is just big honking salt glands, which seems to track when we go across the group over time that we have small salt glands in the earliest thylosuchians draining through a nasal uh, vestibule, so draining through a, a nasal passage, 
moderately sized in the earliest of the metriorhynchoids. So it gets a little bit bigger. And then as we get into metriorhynchids, the fully open ocean group, we have big salt glands. There is a opening in front of the eye that is an exit for the excess salt and is unique to this group. So they had little salt blow holes in front of the eye. They noted that having such notable salt glands could have also had a huge effect on their diet, allowing them to eat food that is maintaining very similar salt levels to the water, like cephalopods. Mm -hmm. You know, not all ocean life has the same amount of salt in their body because they are also regulating it. But some basically are just the same salinity as the water around them. Are just made of seawater. Just made of seawater. This could maybe have allowed them to eat and shift into more unique ocean and marine diets Mm -hmm. than other marine group croc groups could have since they had the glands that could handle all that excess salt. Another feature that commonly comes up is warm bodiedness. We've already mentioned that ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs based on studying the isotopes, you know, the types of molecules that get preserved in their body have indicated that they maintained higher body temperatures than the water around them. This is a common thing we see in groups going back to the water because the water will take a lot of your heat. And if you're wanting to swim long distances, you need a more active metabolism typically to make those journeys. So that question has been looked into for Thalatosuchians. Most other marine crocs just seem very likely to be very Mm croc-like. So probably nothing super different or special going on there. Thalatosuchians show a little bit more variation. Overall, they do seem to be a little bit higher than average body temp. Okay. You know, for a crocodile. But teleosaurids likely had pretty similar croc temperatures, pretty similar temperature control, whilst metriorhynchids seem to be a little bit higher. Somewhere between that and ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, so not quite as warm-bodied as other marine reptile groups at the time, but warmer. Maybe a little bit. Better at regulating that body temperature, yeah. but not to a particular extreme. I, you also mentioned that the marine crocs tend to have been living in warmer places. Yes, indeed. So they can rely on that environment. A lot of them are also large. Yes, which and helps at, a lot. As we've mentioned before, being b- bigger bodies shed heat more slowly. We see that in things today like sea turtles, mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. sea turtles don't regulate their body temperature the way that we think of in animals like us, but they are often gigantic. Yeah, just their thermal <laughs> inertia <laughs> yeah, they just... keeps them from getting too cold. Yes. They did note that it seems like maybe metriorhynchids could temporarily raise their body temperature. Mm-hmm. So they might be able to have periods of higher temperature for more activity. It doesn't seem like they would have been able to maintain that. Okay. We do, though, see some evidence of more specialized thermal control in parts of the body. Thalatosuchians have something called palatal grooves, which are two paired grooves in the roof of the mouth that sync up with bony canals that would have connected the nasal and oral, so the nose and the mouth cavities, and were likely housing blood vessels, you know, some sort of circulatory uh, system there, and is similar to pair grooves that we see in whales Hmm. that also have blood vessel blood flow through there and seem to be for maintaining the temperature and heat regulation of the head. So they may have been warm headed. Yes. Or at least being able to even out, you know, the temperatures more, you know, Mm -hmm. know, with more control. And they did note that due to the shape of their head, that would be suspected that they would need a little bit more, heat maintenance there. So we do see some specialization for warm-bodied, which could have made them more active ocean-going predators. Another very common thing that comes up with ocean-going is, did you give live birth or lay eggs? Now, I didn't see this talked about for any of the other marine groups because most of them were croc-shaped, so probably they were still just going back to land. Right. And it and it seems like they were less heavily adapted for going way out to sea. Yes. And like you just said, yeah, croc shaped in the sense of like you still have legs. Yeah, you can still walk around. You just go back up onto land and you can lay eggs. There's no major pressure to have to give that up. Like it doesn't take that much to be able to do that because today's gharial at full adult size no longer stand up. Mm-hmm. The, the, they just drag themselves they along. They just pull themselves up the shore from there on out. 
and it's not known whether they just don't stand up anymore or can't right. walk anymore because their limbs are smaller <laughs> compared to their body when you compare it to other crocs. So even if some of these, you know, marine crocs that still had legs were not really good on land compared to today's crocodiles, which are not super duper amazing on land all the time. Yep. If you can still belly crawl, you can oh, yeah. still get up to a spot. Sea turtles can do it. Exactly. And sea turtles are way worse off than crocs are. And so this question has come up from Metro Rinkids of, you've got flippers. Were yep. you sea turtling it or were you... Did, did you manage? Yeah. Did you make that transition that we see in so many other Absolutely. groups of aquatic reptiles? And eh, there's not a lot of solid evidence here. We do not have the beautiful ichthyosaur situation of... Right. Where we've got dozens of examples of yeah. pregnant specimens. And like, <laughs> you know, you giving birth almost. <laughs> yeah, in the process of giving birth. <laughs> so there are no solid leads either way. The one paper I found worded it very well, which it was saying there are no cases contradicting live birth. There's okay. nothing that we see that says that shouldn't be possible with live birth. Right. We haven't found eggs. Yes. We haven't found anything that says for sure it can't be. So other than the fact that they're an archosaur, which thus far live birth isn't yeah. really a thing dinosaurs <laughs> birds pterosaurs we have never seen evidence of live birth in archosaurs so other than that there's nothing saying live birth isn't on the table as far as egg laying goes really the main reason that people question it is because their morphology really seems contradictory to coming back to land mm -hmm. that just the flippers and the shape of their body is not as conducive now sea turtles still do it so and and if you looked at a sea turtle... Yeah, and I said, how far up the beach do you think that can get? Right. <laughs> I'll bet you money. <laughs> no way that thing's leaving the water. So it could be. But a lot of people suspect that they might likely, or at least some members, mm -hmm. likely evolved it. There is some potential supporting evidence in the, the pelvic region of the skeleton. They notice that the, the belly ribs there are deflected downward. The pelvic girdle the pelvis is reduced which are very notable compared to other crocodilomorphs okay and the increased depth of this region that this region deepening downward is similar to some features we see in other live bearing marine reptiles okay so, so we could do those could be signs of live bearing so we don't have any evidence one way or the other but we have lots of reasons to suspect that it would make sense for some of you to be giving live birth just because you're living out in the ocean and your skeleton seems like it, that would be easier. And some things of your skeleton seems like you'd be able to. Yeah. But, but that one's going to remain a mystery. And just to clarify for, for people who are curious, especially if you haven't listened to our eggs episode, <laughs> episode 92, uh, they could not have laid eggs in the ocean. No, their eggs they, would not work. Amniotic eggs just don't work out in the ocean, which is why all of our secondarily aquatic amniotes, mammals and reptiles, have to pick one of these options. Yes. Uh, you either stop laying eggs or you figure out a way to get back on land. And we see examples of both. Like there's mm -hmm. group, well, uh, uh, sea snakes are always one of my favorite examples because they do both. And yep, there are examples of both. They are awkward when they come on land. You wouldn't think, you'd be like, why are yeah. you doing that? Because like, that's how I do it. it yeah. Because I, I can't reproduce yes, otherwise. Exactly. I like have sea to make turtles. this work. And it's like, you are a sea turtle. You're about the shape of a giant ravioli. Yeah. And you have full-on flippers. And also, some of you are enormous. Yes. Like, hundreds to thousands of pounds. Of like, it. if there weren't crocs, you'd be the biggest reptile. Yes. <laughs> and yet, uh, yeah, but there's no more sea turtles if I don't get on the beach. Yes. So... Every single one. <laughs> oh, we're going on the beach. Every single marine and aquatic turtle has to come up and dig a hole. Yes. So... <laughs> Even if you don't have claws, yes, you have to dig a hole. And so it, that one is one where it's really hard because it seems like there's as many logical mm -hmm. stances on one side or the other. And I absolutely could picture an awkward flippered croc coming up and just being super unhappy about it. But being like, yep. listen, my eggs got to go somewhere. Listen, they laid their eggs in the water and then they scooped them all up and spit them out. <laughs> <laughs> spit them onto the land. Well, just to carry them in that mouth pot. Yeah. Just, just treading at the surface. <laughs> Come on, baby. <babies. laughs> Come on. Hatch sooner, please. <laughs> yeah, shoot them up into trees yeah. where they'll be safe. Just get one good sneeze. <laughs>
We do see other adaptations that would be less expected. Uh, one of the things you've seen in a lot of aquatic groups is uh, smaller inner ears. Huh. Oh, we've mentioned this before. This has come up with uh, other newses. When we look at the inner ears of whales and stuff, they're much more compacted. And it's thought that this could be just due to the changing in the way you're moving when you move into the water. If you have, so the inner ear structure is one of the things that gives you a sense of balance and lets you note how much you're moving with these big looping tubes that sense the movement of the liquid inside. Big tubes are really good at sensing that movement. Mm -hmm. But if you're diving and spiraling underwater, it might be too sensitive. Right. And that might be over stimulating for typical inner ears. But whatever the reason, we do see a reduction and we see a very similar reduction in Thalassukians. Okay. Uh, they have very whale-like inner ears. Some people have noted that it could be that shortening of the neck that we see in these groups kind of locks your head to the body. So you can't stabilize your head like a bird does mm -hmm. or like even we do. So now if your body tilts at all, your entire head goes with it. <laughs> so you just might need less less input from the the tilt controls so that you don't get overstimulated. We also see a similar trend in the sinuses of the Latusukians compared to whales. This is another area that you will often see reduction in. These are air spaces in the front part of the skull that will often connect to our, your breathing systems. But having air spaces inside your head when you're going deep underwater and having more pressure put upon it can be potentially threatening to the structural integrity of your skull. Mm -hmm. So aquatic groups often will reduce those air spaces to allow for more structured skulls while diving. We see an interesting trend with the Lasukians with some of them showing more compacted sinuses, but the open ocean metriorhynchids actually show some enlargement of spaces, which is counterintuitive because from what we can tell, it does make them structurally less sound. Interesting. But it also opens up the airway and might allow them to breathe better mm -hmm. and take bigger, deeper breaths when they surface. So it might have made them better breathers. And that could also sync up with if they had higher metabolisms for swimming and diving, that this could have made them better divers. So we do see something a little bit different there. This difference, along with the fact that like the inner ear in Thalassukians seems to have only made that a, a marine adaptation after they had been ocean going for quite some time. While in whales, that shows up pretty much right away. Hmm. So that was a thing that changed in them to adapt to the sea quicker or earlier in their lineage, while it only happened after Thalassukians had been aquatic for quite some time. So it could suggest that even though these two groups are very comparable in many ways, they might have taken very different routes to get to these similar body shapes. Yeah, and they may have been living in different ways, mm -hmm. doing different things. Uh, one thing noted that, you know, one of those reasons that we see a different rate of certain things showing up in cetaceans, for example, is they may have already been more prepared for a marine lifestyle, being warm-bodied and giving live birth mm -hmm. ancestrally and not having to develop adaptations for those things. Yeah, it was a quicker transition. It might have been much easier while Thalassukians needed to adjust to being out in the ocean and then we started seeing some of those you know, more specific features come in. And then the final category of you know, convergent marine things that I want to talk about is something that doesn't seem like it has anything to do with being in the ocean, which is their long, thin snouts. Yeah, you mentioned that a lot of them had those garial-like long, thin snouts. Yeah, that is a phrase used over and over and over and over again in research papers talking about marine crocs, is garial-like, yep. garial-adjacent, similar to garial. Long, thin, longirostrine snouts is just super common in marine croc groups. Not all of them. You know, we mentioned ones that were wide snout and blunt toothed and short snout. Like there were, there's still variation, but if you average it all out, long, thin snout is the one you would most likely draw out of a bag. Right. <laughs> Something long with a toothpick face. And this is a bit of a mystery. It's, it's a bit of a conundrum when we look at crocodilomorph evolution for a couple of reasons. We see long, thin snouts show up multiple times. There was a time where it was thought that there was a long, thin snouted group. Right. Uh, and I think there still is a group named Longirostrines. Hmm. 
it no longer is considered to be the group of all the slender snouts, but there, at one point it was thought that, well, obviously those are related to each other because it's so distinct. Right. But nowadays we don't think that, partially just because we've seen as we can continue to lay out the relationships of crocs throughout history that snout shapes evolve convergently in different groups all the time. Yeah, they keep going back and forth. Yeah, that they will all evolve similar shaped snouts just individually in different groups and when you break it out it seems like there's no way to sink all the long snouts up into one group right most likely it showed up at least three times i saw tethysuchia thalatosuchia and yusuchia named as the three times it seems like this overall as a trend came up but still could have been coming up individually because we have crocodiles today that are long thin snout crocodiles that aren't gharials right so it still could have been showed up multiple times within there, but overall big groups of thin snouted crocs at least three times. That's what all of the skeletal data says. Molecular data says two. Mm-hmm. Molecular data would group sna- long snouted crocs into two major originations. And that's one of the big issues we run into is that the skeletal data and the molecular data, the genetic data, don't line up a lot of the time. And it's hard to tell whether or not we are, whether we're taking in the the misleading parts of the DNA or that the skeleton is just so convergent that it's messing up the analysis because it's, we are using the wrong features to figure out who's related because those features are actually convergent. Another layer to this is the fact that this is often attributed to having similar feeding styles. Long, thin snouts are less robust than a you know, thicker, wider snout, so they can't take as much stress, meaning they can't take down as big of prey typically, Mm -hmm. and they are better for moving through the water with quick snaps, which would make them good for catching fish. This is what we see in today's gharial, but as I have soapboxed many a time, (laughs) the false gharial has a much wider variety of foods going all the way up to monkeys, pigs, and people. So assuming the diet has been something that we've typically done and will still typically do because... It still makes sense, but it is not as guaranteed as as we've tended to think. That distinction between the morphological and the genetic disagreeing is one of the famous things with gharials and false gharials. False gharials have skulls a little bit more similar to crocs, but DNA that says that they should go with gharials, according to our, re- our current understanding. Right now, they are grouped to the gharials, but that was a debate for quite some time. And then just figuring out which groups are related to each other overall has been a debate. This is the big thing that drives the position of Thalatosuchia, mm-hmm. where it was moving up and down that tree, is very much because of this long-snouted convergence. Just as a quick refresher, the three positions it could be in is sister to crocodiliform, so just a crocodilomorph, but not a crocodiliform, a basal member, so at toward the base of crocodiliforms, but not within mesocrocodilians, so still outside of ones closer to today's crocodiles, or within Neosuchia, sister, so right next to Tethysuchia, but still not within true crocodiles. And one of the things that will shift that is whether or not you include Tethysuchia, or how much of you you include in analyses trying to group the group. Mm -hmm. If you include them, you'll often see that Thalassuchia moves up the tree closer to true crocodiles. If you don't include them, it moves down the tree farther from true crocodiles. And if you include some of them, it will change depending on which one you include, dryosaurids or thalidosaurs. So it's very comp- it's very tough to figure out why we're getting so much confusion. Is it because the snouts are similar, because they're related, because they're convergent, are some convergent and some related? And this has been noted as the laundrostring problem. Mm-hmm. In quotes. Yep, yep. This is a term you will <laughs> see show up in papers talking about crocodilomorph evolution because it has so consistently with the gharial and Temistema, with Thalatosuchia and its related cousins, with figuring out feeding behaviors, consistently it shows up as a difficult puzzle to f- parse out what exactly is happening in crocodilomorph evolution because of how often we see extremely similar long-snouted skulls show up. 
Yep. And it just confuses our comparisons in very much the same way that we've often talked about how with something like Thaladasukians, mm-hmm. this has come up with turtles, it comes up with snakes, where you have a group that has gotten so different from its relatives, it can be difficult to find good comparisons. This is kind of the opposite problem. Yep. You are so similar to so many other things convergently that our analysis keeps getting pulled in different directions and some of them are wrong. Yes. We are being fooled in some directions yeah. and we don't know which directions are the fool ones. Somewhere we are making a mistake of comparison mm-hmm. and we are not sure where that is. And it could very well be that some of the features of the skull that we're saying, all right, this is a distinct feature and whatever state it's in, you know, whatever type of that feature we have is very important to tell us what group that one's in. If we're wrong about that, though, if we have mistaken that and gone, actually, this version of that feature shows up twice in two different groups. Mm -hmm. That's not actually as specific as you thought it was. That can mess up. So a lot of our shared features might be mistaken. Some of them might not be defined well enough. You know, we might not have been specific enough as to what does long snouted mean? Yep. Some of them might not be defined well enough because we don't have good fossils yep. of them. Where there may be there may be certain aspects of the skull that are really useful for comparative analysis, but it's the part that just never gets preserved yes. well. If you compare the fronts of the snouts, you get these results. But if you compared the back of the snout, you would have gotten these results. Right, exactly. And so there's a lot going on here. And it's something that we're still very much in the midst of, like... The the Garial false Garial debate, not when I was in college, it was the flip. <laughs> yep. False Garials were closer to crocodiles, and everyone was like, no, no, look at them. They're much closer to crocodiles. They're not actually a true Garial. And then more and more genetic studies came out, and nowadays, if you go on Wikipedia, under Gavialidae, you have them both. <laughs> yes. So it is now something, or Gavialoidae, I think. Uh, you have them both now grouped with the Gavialoids. And we're still trying to figure out what is the deal with these slender snouted crocs. And it is a oddly consistent marine feature, which could make sense if we go with that they're eating fish. But if that's not actually what that indicates, if your diets could be much more varied, then why do we see it so up so many times? Mm -hmm. Is it because your ancestor had it, so it's the common form? Or are you all convergently evolving to slender snouts for some reason? I saw it noted that the laundry rostering problem, and then they listed specifically the Gavialis tomistoma problem, mm-hmm. are two of the largest phylogenetic controversies in Crocodile Morpha. <laughs> These are the this issues. Is, this is what croc experts <laughs> argue about. Yes, exactly. And with that... With, with that mystery ending. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Come back for part two in 166 more episodes. Find out on the next issue. Oh, man. In, in 166 more episodes, there may be completely different answers. Right, absolutely. We'll have a different, there'll be a fourth one. Yes. Added to the They'll list. Go, actually. Of where they might be. Actually, they might, might, uh, they might be pterosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> this has been tons of fun getting to explore these Many times, surprisingly unweird crocs. Like, yeah, a bunch of them. It doesn't. You don't have to vary much from the croc body. No. to make it all the way out into the sea. Like a lot of the ones that still had hands and feet were open ocean, deep water marine species. Yeah, they're just chilling out there with toes still, <laughs> which is super weird. Uh, all the way up to just. Full on just mosasaur, mosasaur shaped crocs. <laughs> yeah, just shark crocs. Yeah, just full blown. I had tons of fun trekking through these groups. Uh, I learned a bunch. There's a whole bunch of marine groups that I do, I wasn't familiar with because they are so often over overshadowed. Yeah, the blog post will have lots of pictures mm-hmm. and links to show you what things we've been talking about. If you have a favorite, if you have questions, if you have comments. Please share. If you have opinions on the laundry rostering problem, (laughs) weigh in. (laughs) Before we sign off, one last section. We, every episode, like to answer a patron question. Our patrons at certain levels can submit questions to us, which we will answer here on the podcast. And here on this episode of the podcast, we would like to answer what question? The question today comes from Corbin, who asks... 
In many of the news discussions, we hear about phylogenetic analysis. Hey, we just talked about phylogenetic analysis. What a convenient question for this episode. Corbin goes on to say, can you explain more about what that process looks like for a paleontologist? Happily. So phylogenetic trees, that is the, that's what our, you know, uh, default original logo is, is that branching tree that Darwin first sketched in Mm -hmm. Origin of the Species. This is a representation of the relatedness of organisms. You know, the organisms placed on that tree, these branches should tell you who is most closely related to who. And if you use one of the trees that also accounts for time, the length of the branches should tell you how long ago those relations were and how long it's been since they were closely related to each other. We form these trees by going through a data set for whatever group it is. You know, this could be plants, germs, animals. We can use it with physical characteristics or with genetic characteristics. We're going to compare whatever list it is that we're trying to group, and we're going to list a suite of characteristics. So if we were doing, you know, if we were doing vehicles, we could say, all right, number of wheels, Mm -hmm. number of doors, number of lights, you know, uh, except that number be- of seats, because it's a phylogenetic analysis, it would get into like dimensions of wheels, yes. thickness of tire material that the the hubcap is made of number of treads yeah, yep. on the tire. And that's kind of one of the things is with phylogenetic analysis is you can be zoomed out or way zoomed in yep. to where it's like, all right, but how many millimeters long is and this compared to this. You'll often see in, in papers that publish big phylogenetic analyses, there'll be these giant tables yep. of features. And it'll be these hyper-specific, like, this is just the skull, and what is the shape of this piece, and what is the length of this piece, and what is the size of this piece. And you define how you're rating those features. You know, if we're doing, you know, tooth length, all right, we're going to have these categories, or we're going to measure it, and we're measuring it this way. And then what you are aiming to do is to sort out derived from ancestral traits. We're looking for when along a tree, a new trait shows up that wasn't present in the old trait or a trait is lost. So you can either lose or have a new trait show up, but that's a derived condition. And then the ancestral one is whatever came before it. That will typically be where you see those branches Mm -hmm. come off. So that's where something happened. Something new showed up and we cause a little branch. And that new thing will be one of the things that is used to describe that branch. This is distinct to that branch. That's what the info we're using and how it chooses the branching. The way we do that is with statistical analysis to Mm. compare the values of all these traits and parse out which ones share more, which ones are similar enough to be grouped together on a branch or a few branches, which are distinct enough to cause a branching event, you know, a node where it branches. And nowadays there are statistical programs we can enter these data sets and these tables into and even define how many branches the tree should, you know, be limited to or have. Right. What we we have uh, programs that will understand what shapes to expect from a phylogenetic tree. Yes. We can even calibrate them and go, hey, this event has to happen before this because we have a fossil that tells us yes. this age. And then we go, all right. Here's a million data points. Find the statistical likelihood. And the program's doing the math that previously would have just been worked out on paper. Yeah, this is why phylogenetic analysis became so, so important and widespread starting around the 80s. Yep. (laughs) Because we invented computers that could do it. And one of the things that can get so complicated with this is... What features you include or what species or what you know members of the group you include or don't include can vastly change the results if you are making mistaken comparisons or if you're not defining things in a way that is as clear as you think it is, like mm-hmm. the example with Thalatosuchians. What groups are included in studies with them changes their position on the tree quite a bit, which could be because we are misinterpreting which features are most important to include, or we aren't describing them correctly. So the program is just telling us what the results are based on what we're giving it, but we might be focusing on the wrong features, the wrong characteristics to get the correct answer. So the data you get out is highly dependent on the data you put in. Yes. 
And also, oftentimes when you look at these studies, these analyses will put out multiple different phylogenetic trees. Yes. Because, and this is a thing that uh, we, we've mentioned this before, there is a correct answer yep. to the relationships of all lineages of life. Yeah, evolution happened some specific way up until now. <laughs> yes. Every time a study puts out a result of a phylogenetic analysis to interpret those relationships, it's a hypothesis. Yes, we from what we can tell and the information we have, this seems the most likely answer to how we got where we are today. Yes. So every time you see one of those coming out of a paper that's like, here, we sorted out the relationships using genetics, using whatever of this group, that tree is a hypothesis mm -hmm. of that relationship. A lot of times studies will come out with multiple hypotheses, and it could be because these are, oftentimes you'll read it and it'll be like, our analysis generated 1,200 trees, we chose these four. Yes. And they chose the four because they were the most statistically well-resolved, or because they fit certain criteria that we knew we had to fit because of this other data. So often, with even in one analysis, there will be a couple of different best possible answers. Well, like earlier in the episode, we mentioned that typically it's thought that crocs moved into the water at least three times. Mm -hmm. But if one group is also more semi-aquatic than, than not, there could be a fourth time. But that very much depends on what behavior we interpret for that croc. Right. And then if our phylogeny changes, mm -hmm. that can also change. If our understanding of their relationships changes. Yeah, we, go, we realize oh, two of those groups are actually the same group. Yeah, that actually is within this group. All right, then that's but, only one time. That's, yeah, that's just, that's now two instead of three times because we combined two of them, realizing that they should have been grouped together to begin with. Yes. So it is a const, it is shifting. You will see like the multiple ones where it's very often of, if we include this, since it has sometimes been interpreted as a member of this group, we get this result. Without that member, we get this result. And a lot of times those will end up being very similar. Right. Sometimes, though, it will be very different, which yeah. means we need to figure this out <laughs> because evidently the ambiguity on this this thing here is causing a lot of confusion when we run the program. So we need to figure this out. It gives us a idea of where to focus next. Yeah. That is a very streamed, you know, streamlined and, and pared down <laughs> view. Explanation. Uh, yes. I don't actually, I've never actually done a phylogenetic analysis myself. Mm -hmm. And even with just the bit I did with the morphology of the skull, the amount of details you can get into for the characters for a thing is insane. Yeah. Well, you can get as detailed as you want. Yes. And there are both pros and cons if you go too low or too high as you can start adding in too much information to where now there's noise there's info that's not actually helpful and too little you'll miss stuff so it, it can get very complicated and that's why you will often see revisiting of people going all right we did we redid the same group to try to find the same tree but we used these other features because we wanted to see if these are actually as important or maybe more you know maybe better for figuring this out and you'll see that very often. I thought this question was a very good fit for this episode since yep. <laughs> this is basically what most of the Laundra Ross stream problem is dealing with is the phylogenetics and how complicated it can get when you get into certain scenarios that give you features that are hard to separate out. Yeah. So thanks, Corbin. Great question. And with that, we can wrap up this episode and not quite wrap up Croc it's Month. It's pretty but, close to wrapping up. But, this is kind of the last big thing for Croc Month. There you go. This has been the theme. We promised the, a themed episode mm -hmm. for Croc Month. We return to Crocs. If you haven't checked out the bonus Croc episode, do it. If you haven't hopped in the Discord server for Croc Chat, do it. If you haven't signed up for the Crocs and Snakes tier on Patreon, go ahead and consider doing that. In just a bit, we will transition over to July... And we will have a bonus episode for snakes. We will have the snake stuff channel open. The Crocs and Snakes tier will become the Snakes and Crocs tier with the same conditions that if you subscribe at that tier, you will help contribute to charitable donations. We will be making to Croc and Snake research and conservation. And the next episode of the podcast, 169, will be our return to snakes. Uh, back can, to back as they always should be. Can you 
guess what the next episode's about? <laughs> and he guesses what the theme's going to be? <laughs> I, I had to mindfully uh, uh, choose what to include in these notes yeah. <laughs> because of times where there could There's have been overlap. Some overlap. <laughs> Check out the blog post uh, where we will have pictures and links for more stuff. Check out the social media and all the normal stuff. Let us know if you have thoughts, feelings about this episode. Go into the Croc Discord channel. We can talk about the Laundra Ross stream problem for however long you want. I <laughs> love to talk about it. And mourn the fact that we don't have truly marine crocs anymore today. Sad. Very sad. All right. We release episodes every fortnight. Uh, next time, listen, we're done talking about long snouted things. <laughs> we're going to talk about things with long everything. Uh, long things, long body. Long, long snake. That exactly, that's what it's going to, that's the next, the name of the next episode. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.